typically they knew what had happened to John Huss. We also read a statement about the condition that Huss was in when he was brought forth from prison. It was a terrible sight. And we need to understand that at this point Huss had not even had a trial. But we're also told that after Huss was cleaned up when he was brought forth from prison, he was taken before a religious court. We need to understand that this is a religious court. The state is still not involved. All of the individuals that are present are religious magistrates. I read from the book Huss the Heretic, page 28. With the clock striking eight and the bells tolling, tolling the procession of bishops, cardinals, fathers, and deputies move towards the church. Where is the trial going to take place? In the church. Where a chair had been placed for Huss about which the seats of the gentlemen were arranged. Forty-seven charges were read against Huss. None of them involved a violation of civil law. All of the accusations had to do with the convictions of his conscience, not following the teachings of the church. Uh, we are told by uh, Pogius that those who were present when Huss tried to defend himself, they shouted, much like uh, the Jews had done at the trial of Christ. It's interesting to notice that when the shouts subsided somewhat, Huss spoke some very significant words, and I want you to notice these words in the light of what we've studied already. God gave to Peter, his disciple, the key to open all hearts and the heaven of faith with it, but not the sword. Notice, Jesus did not give Peter what? The sword. Which sword is this talking about? Did, did he give Peter the sword of the Spirit? Yeah. But what sword is this? The sword of civil power, right? But not the sword to slay as you slay all those who do not accept your worldly doctrines and who evade them. What is the issue? The worldly doctrines of the church. So then the vote is taken as to whether Huss is guilty or not. Thirty-one of those uh, church dignitaries that were present voted that Huss was not guilty. Eleven voted that he was guilty and they said that he should be excommunicated. But 45 of those present voted that Huss was guilty and that he should die. But the problem is the church could not execute the death penalty. As a church they could not do what they wished to do. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Remember what happened in the Gospels with Jesus Christ? They needed the help of the emperor. Now the emperor at this time was Sigismund. And Sigismund had given Huss a guarantee, a safe conduct, that he would be uh, taken from Prague to Constance and then he would be able to go back safely to Prague. But the Sigismund now had to decide whether he was going to respect that safe conduct. And the religious dignitaries who were present there said to the emperor, you know, you don't have to respect an agreement that you have made with heretics. Now, when the, uh, the emperor was making the decision as to whether he should deliver Huss to death, there was a count who was present, Count Schlum, who spoke the following words. He's speaking to Sigismund. Caesar, interesting that he would refer to him as Caesar, right? This is a secular power. Caesar, desist from such doings. Caesar, Caesar, do not write your name with blood. But we are told by Pogus that Sigismund's conscience was quieted by the religious leaders. And I read from page 63 of his book, But the emperor's ears were deaf and were further closed by the cardinals, bishops, and priests who crowded about him, kissed the hem of his garments, and praised his name when he seized the quill and wrote his name. The date of the sentence was July 5, 1415. I've been there, as I mentioned. It's a moving experience to know what happened in that place. 
The founding fathers knew about the history of the church during the 1260 years. They knew about the mechanism of persecution and the Inquisition. So allow me to say a few things about the Inquisition that functioned during part of the 1260 years. In Latin America the Inquisition functioned in three countries. It functioned also in Europe, but in Latin America it functioned in three countries. In Colombia, in Peru, and in Mexico. Several years ago I was invited to give a series of meetings at our university near the city of Lima, and I knew that uh, there was a palace of the Inquisition in Lim Lima, and I was very interested in visiting uh, this place. And so one afternoon when I wasn't uh, uh, busy, I asked them if they would take me to the Museum of the Inquisition, and they did. Uh, as you enter the, the uh, palace of the Inquisition, uh, you have a large mural or a large uh, portrait of an auto de fe, that means when an individual is being tried and is going to be burned at the stake. And this mural is portraying an auto de fe that is taking place at the Plaza de Armas, which is the central plaza there in the city of Lima. And then after explaining, you know, how heretics were burned at the stake because they didn't agree with the teachings and practices of the church, the young tour guide took us to the torture chamber and gave us a tour of all of the sample torture implements that were used by the Inquisition. Just matter of fact, explain, you know, this was used for this and this was used for that. Let me, let me just go through some of these implements that were used by the papacy through the power of the state to persecute those who did not agree with the teachings of the church. We have first of all the strapado. The victim's wrists were bound behind their back with one end of the rope and then the loose end was tossed over an elevated beam. Now you can imagine this, with hands tied behind the back the victim would then be slowly raised by pulling on the loose end of the rope, and when the victim was high above the ground, the loose end was abruptly released and then stopped slightly before the victim reached the ground, thus dislocating the arms and the shoulders. Sometimes weights of 25 pounds, this is everything that the, that the tour guide said by the way, Sometimes weights of up to 25 pounds were bound to the victim's feet to make the drop more precipitous and dislocation more painful, simply because they did not agree with the church. Next, he, next you have the whipping post. Now I can see myself going through. These, these first two implements of torture are on the right hand side of the room. The whipping post. With hands and feet in stocks, the prisoner was beaten with a uh, beaten and whipped on his bare back a minimum of 50 times and a maximum of 200 times, simply because he did not agree with the teachings and practices of the papal church. Then you take a left turn and on the left hand side there is the rack, Ellen White mentions in her writings the rack. The victim was laid upon a table, face up with arms and legs extended. The victim's ankles and wrists were then tied with ropes that were attached to pulleys at the four ends of the table. Wheels at either end of the board were turned pulling the legs downward and the arms upward. As the ropes got tighter and tighter the body was stretched in opposite directions from the limbs. As the victim was commanded to recant the shoulders, elbows, thighs and ankles were slowly dislocated as the prisoner writhed in pain because the prisoner did not agree with the teachings and practices of the church because of the convictions of his conscience. Then on the right hand side is the garrote. It was an instrument that slowly strangled the victim. The hands and feet were tied with the rope to the arms and legs of the chair and a noose was tied around the neck. In back of the chair was a wheel that worked as a tourniquet. The wheel was slowly turned and this pulled the rope tighter and tighter around the hands, the feet and the neck until the victim was strangled. 
And this young person who was giving me the tour was simply matter-of-factly describing all of these implements of torture that were used by the church against those who did not agree with the teachings and practices of the church. By the way, next was waterboarding. Because <laughs> you go around the other corner, and on the right-hand side, you have an individual who's lying on a bench. By, it's a mannequin, by the way. And there's this individual that is pouring water down the mouth and is putting a rag inside the mouth. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. That happened in Iraq, by the way, with uh, individuals that uh, were being interrogated. Then, after this, we went down deep into underground tunnels where dungeons had been, strewn, uh, had, been, um, had been hewn in the rock. The cubicles were barely larger than the person who was enclosed in them. For days, the victims were left in the cold in absolute and complete darkness, barely enough room to wiggle with the family not knowing where they were. That is what happened as a result of the horrendous mechanism of the Inquisition. And the Founding Fathers knew that. They knew that the church had used the state to persecute those individuals simply because of their convictions, their religious convictions of their conscience. And the Founding Fathers said, it is not going to be like that in this nation that we are going to establish. We are going to establish a different kind of government where yes, in one nation, you're going to have two kingdoms in that nation. You're going to have two powers in that nation. You're going to have the church and you're going to have the state. But we will make sure that the state is not able to influence the church and the church is not able to influence the state. They will function in their own sphere with their own sword. So the founding fathers knew what happened when church and state were united during the 1260 years. But they also knew what happened in the territory of the United States during the colonial period. You see, the Constitutional Fathers knew all about the history of the colonial period. They were well aware that individuals such as atheists, Jews, Quakers, Baptists were deprived of their civil rights simply because their beliefs and practices did not square with those of the established church, which was the Puritan church. The founders knew very well about Sunday laws in the colonial period. And people who, did, who violated Sunday were fined, lashed, imprisoned, and in last, at least in three of the 13 colonies, there was a death, death sentence against those individuals who violated Sunday as the day of rest. Only individuals who belonged to the established church could serve in positions of the government. If you did not belong to the established church, you could not lend civil service. They knew full well about Roger Williams who was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in September of 1635 for his views concerning the separation of church and state. They knew how Roger Williams was forced to flee late in 1635 and early in 1636 in a, the dead of winter, a bitter winter as he describes. He had to flee because he was banished from the colony. And how he finally ended up in what it to, is today Rhode Island and established the capital of Rhode Island, why do you suppose it's called Providence? It's because he believed that God had taken him there through divine providence. Roger Williams, I believe, is the first individual uh, coming out of the period of the 1260 years that fully and completely understood the idea of civil and religious liberty the separation of church and state. He was a strict separationist. Notice what he had to say. This is in a book that really I would recommend everyone to read. It's a really, really great book. It's called uh, Separating Church and State by Timothy Hall. Uh, he quotes Roger Williams as saying, The forcing of a woman, that is the violent acting of uncleanness upon her body against her will, we count rape. By proportion, that is a spiritual or soul rape, 
which is forcing of the conscience of any person to acts of worship. He says, that, in other words, persecution, violating conscience, is spiritual rape, is what Roger Williams is saying. On our next page, Roger Williams stated, the civil magistrate possesses a civil sword. Notice the word that he uses, the expression. Possesses the civil sword for the defense of persons, estates, families, liberties of a city or civil state, and the suppressing of uncivil or injurious persons or actions. So in other words, he says the civil sword is to preserve the civil order of society. Are you catching the point? Once again, uh, we find in this book uh, the, by, um, by Timothy Hall these words of explanation. Nor did Williams think that toleration required believers in different faiths to leave one another alone. <laughs> he didn't say, well, you know, you just simply, you don't say anything bad about anybody else's religion. Oh, no, no, he didn't believe that. Proselytization, in other words, trying to gain converts from other, from other churches, for him was entirely consistent with religious liberty. He believed in a militant faith, although one whose militancy, militancy expressed itself through spiritual weapons such as preaching and persuasion and prayer rather than through civic violence. The religious toleration Williams advocated was one that would leave believers free to undertake spiritual warfare against spiritual error. He sought to sheath the civil sword so that the sword of spiritual truth could be wielded against apostasy and unbelief. Did Roger believe it, uh, Williams believe in two swords? In the civil sword and the religious sword? Did he believe that you could use a religious sword to try and persuade people from other denominations to join yours by preaching the truth? Absolutely. Now, Roger Williams used a very interesting expression similar to Revelation 13, 11. It makes me wonder whether perhaps he, he I, I know that he translated scripture for the Native Americans into different dialects, so he was acquainted with the Bible. Maybe he was thinking of Revelation 13, verse 11 when he, when he spoke this. He said, that uh, when a follower of Christ advocates persecution against those who disagree with him, he is guilty of the language of the dragon in a lamb's lip. <laughs> Interesting that he would say that. This is, this is back in the 1600s, folks. This is before uh, this prophecy is fulfilled. Interestingly enough, <laughs> The sentence of banishment against Roger Williams that was given in September of 1635 was not lifted until 1936 when Bill 488 was expunged from the laws of Massachusetts. And this is how they say, stated it. Resolved that the sentence of expulsion passed up against Roger Williams by the General Court of Massachusetts Bay Colony in the year 1635 B and hereby is revoked. So finally in the year 1936 Roger Williams was once again allowed to come back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. <laughs> this was a post-mortem post decree. <laughs> now uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, concerning the colonial period, uh, the colony of Virginia, Southern Baptist minister and Republican congressman uh, John Buchanan once said this, preachers like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell, and Falwell is dead by the way, should not forget that in the colony of Virginia, Baptist ministers were beaten and imprisoned and run out of town for preaching their dissenting faith with Anglican ministers, uh, while Anglican ministers were paid with tax funds from the state treasury. So in other words, they need to, they need to remember, you know, that uh, uh, they would have been persecuted during the colonial period for being Baptists. So the founding fathers knew what happened in the colonial period. 
when people were required to belong to the established church on pain of civil penalties. And they said that's not going to happen in these United States of America that we're going to found. We are going to establish a nation built on a different principle. And that is that yes, there will be two kingdoms in the United States, the state and the church. They are both legitimate. They both need to function within their sphere. They both have their own sword, but they need to function separately, not together. Now let's talk about the Constitutional Fathers and the Bible. You know, they, the Constitutional Fathers read the Bible. You know, they didn't believe a lot because they were, they were deists. But they knew very well the story of what had happened in the death of Jesus Christ. They knew about the persecution of, of the apostles by the apostate Jewish church. They knew from Scripture what happened when the state gave decrees forbidding religious worship or abridging the right to worship. And so the founding fathers, when they were going to establish this nation, they were doing it in the light of the past. They knew what happened during the 1260 years. They knew very well what happened during the colonial period. They knew from Scripture what happened when church and state were joined together. And they said, this is not going to happen in this nation. We are going to try a revolutionary experiment in the United States. So let's talk a little bit about the founding documents of the United States, that which makes the United States what it is. The founding documents of the United States are clearly of divine origin. I'm not saying they're inspired, but they were inspired by God. In 1776, the Declaration of Independence affirmed that all men are created equal and have certain inalienable rights, that means rights that God guarantees that government cannot take away, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1787, the Constitution of the United States was ratified. And in 1791, you have the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments to the Constitution of the United States. Now, as I mentioned before, it's very significant that these three documents were ratified immediately before the papacy received its deadly wound, which means that the next world superpower was rising at the same time that the previous power was going to receive its deadly wound. An examination of the writings of the Constitutional Fathers reveals that they firmly believed in the legitimate existence of two kingdoms within the single nation of the United States and that they were to remain forever separate. According to their view, the church was given the spiritual sword to persuade through the preaching of the Word of God. And the state was given the material sword to preserve the civil order of society. These two principles, based on the idea of two kingdoms, church and state, are called republicanism, which is a representative civil government with the civil sword, and Protestantism, which is representative of religious government with the religious sword. During the Middle Ages, all civil matters were decided by whom? By the king. And all religious matters were decided by the pope. Thus all the power flowed from top to bottom. When the pope spoke, the people were simply expected to obey without question. When the king spoke, that word was law. People had no freedom or liberty either in civil matters or in religious matters. The Constitutional Fathers of the United States established a government that turned all that idea upside down, where the power flowed from the bottom up. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people through duly elected representatives. And the Founding Fathers believed, folks, that the legitimate existence of the church and of the state could take place in the single nation of the United States of America. The United States functioning as a republic in civil matters and allowing the church to function as a church in its own sphere. 
This was one of the most revolutionary experiences in the history of the world. Did you realize that Ellen White was born just 27 years after the deadly wound? Notice what Ellen White had to say about the colonial period as compared with the constitutional period of the United States. This is in the book The Great Controversy. Great Controversy, um, you don't have the page there, but uh, it's earlier in the syllabus. It says, among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum, now listen carefully to this, and sought an asylum from royal oppression, what, would, what uh, power would that have to do with? The state, right? And priestly intolerance. Church, right? So what are they looking for? They're looking for freedom, civil matters, and freedom in religious matters. She continues saying, were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil, that's the state part, and religious liberty, that is the church part. Their views found place in the Declaration of Independence, which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by popular vote shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted. Every man permit, being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. Republicanism, that is a state without a king, and Protestantism, a church without a pope, became the fundamental principles of the nation. Amen. What is the United States built upon? <laughs> Separation of what? Church and state. So how many kingdoms in the United States? Two. two. Do you know what? I'm a, I live in one country, but I'm a citizen of two kingdoms. Yeah. You know, I am, a, I am a U.S. citizen by birth, but I'm a citizen of the church by the new birth. <laughs> and I have my passport, U.S. passport, but I also have my religious passport, the blood of the Lamb. But I live in one nation. One nation under God. Now, listen carefully. What is the secret of the prosperity of the United States of America? Listen to Great Controversy 441. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. What is the secret of, of the prosperity and power of the United States? The idea that the church should function as church and state as state. Separation of church and state. What will lead to national apostasy? Joining church and state. And that will lead to a loss of power and prosperity. Ellen White says it will lead to national ruin. Are you seeing how the theme of church and state comes through in all of this? Time and again, time and again, church and state. That's why we have a religious liberty department. And some people, some Adventists naively say, well, you know, why do we have a religious liberty department? You know, what it does is it just prolongs things, prolongs things, you know. Just let, let church and state join together so we can go home. It sounds pretty plausible. You know, why should our religious liberty be fighting for the separation of church and state? Mainly because we want everybody in the world to understand the importance of this so they can be saved and be on the right side. That's the real reason. It's not to delay the inevitable. It's, it's so that when the time comes, our, our religious liberty magazine, liberty magazine, and all of these liberty rallies that we have will help people see the issues so they come out on the right side. That's why liberty is sent to politicians, it's sent to lawyers, it's sent to thought thinkers in the U.S. so that when the time comes, you might be happy to have one of those individuals who receive liberty represent you in court. Amen. <laughs> so we need a religious liberty department in the church. 
Ellen White says in Great Controversy 442, the founders of the nation sought to guard wisely, the, the founders of the nation wisely sought to guard against the employment of the secular power on the part of the church with its inevitable result, intolerance and persecution. Now listen carefully. In this way, the Founding Fathers rejected the apostate Roman Catholic view that the Roman Catholic Church has that you're supposed to join church and state. And it went back to the view that was held by the apostles in New Testament times. They returned to the view of the early church. That church is supposed to function as church and state is supposed to function as state. Now you say, well, all this is uh, fine and dandy, it's beautiful rhetoric, but can we read some things that the Founding Father said to see if this is true? Well, that's what we're going to go next. In our syllabus, the first individual that we are going to read from is George Washington. I think that's a good place to start. First President of the United States, the liberator of the United States from uh, England, and he who presided the Constitutional Convention. Notice what he had to say to the Baptist delegation in 1789. If I could have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution framed by the Convention where I had the honor to preside might possibly endanger the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, certainly I would never have placed my signature on it. And if I could now conceive that the general government, that's the federal government, might ever be so administered as to render the liberty of conscience insecure, I beg you, I beg you will be persuaded that no one would be more zealous than myself to establish effectual barriers against the horrors of spiritual tyranny and every species of religious persecution. For you doubtless remember that I have often expressed my sentiments that any man conducting himself as a good citizen, what does kingdom does that have to do with? The civil power. Conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions, what kingdom does that have to do with? With the church. Ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own conscience. Did George Washington believe in the separation of church and state, two kingdoms in one nation? He most certainly did. What about Benjamin Franklin? I love this statement. He had a sense of humor. When religion is good, I concede that it will support itself. And when it, does, when it does not support itself, and God does not take care to support it, so that its professors are obliged to call for the help of the civil powers, tis a sign I apprehend of it being a bad one. <laughs> did Benjamin Franklin have the idea that the church should be separate from the state? He most certainly did. What about Thomas Jefferson? We're going to read several statements from Thomas Jefferson. He was one of the framers of the Constitution. I visited the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. several times. Have you ever visited the Jefferson Memorial? You know, I like to just sit there and like to read the inscriptions on the marble walls, white marble walls. In fact, one day I wrote these words. These words that I'm going to, that I'm going to read now, I wrote with my own hand, and then I copied onto my computer. I want you to notice what Jefferson had to say about this issue of church and state. Almighty God hath created the mind, what? Free. All attempts to influence it by temporal, what would temporal be? The civil power, right? By temporal punishment or burdens are a departure from the plan of the author, holy author of our religion. No man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship or ministry, or shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief. But all men 
shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion. I know but one code of morality for men, whether acting singly or collectively. Did uh, Jefferson believe in the separation of church and state? He most certainly did. Um, and then comes this uh, somewhat humor, humorous statement. The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. It does me no injury for my neighbor to say that there are twenty gods or no gods. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. <laughs> does the government have a right to protect you against pickpockets and against people who breaks your leg? Absolutely. <laughs> but what he's saying is that's, that's the legitimate power of the government. It's not dealing with religious things. So if you want to have five thousand gods, so be it. That doesn't hurt me at all for my neighbor to believe that. In 1782 Jefferson wrote this, It is error alone which needs the support of government. Truth can stand by itself. Wow. Was he clear on this separation of church and state? Absolutely. Jefferson knew about the Inquisition. Notice this statement. Is uniformity, uniformity in matters of religion, in other words, should all, should all churches come together? Is that attainable? Millions of innocent men, women, and children since the introduction of Christianity have been burnt, tortured, fined, imprisoned. Yet we have not advanced one inch towards uniformity. He's speaking of belief and practice. What has been the effect of coercion? To make one half of the world's fools and the other half hypocrites. Why does he say fools? He's saying because, because you get killed because of what you believe. And a hypocrite because you go along in order not to get killed. <laughs> so are you with me? Now, Jefferson stated that people should be willing to die as martyrs in order to preserve civil and religious liberty. Notice what he had to say. To preserve the freedom of the human mind, then and freedom of the press. Every spirit should be ready to devote itself to martyrdom. For as long as we may think as we will, and speak as we think, the condition of man will proceed in improvement. You know the Religious Liberty Department of the General Conference defends other churches when they deal with church-state matters. Even the Catholic Church. The Adventist Church uh, be, uh, files amicus briefs mm -hmm. with the Roman Catholic Church when the government wants to infringe upon the church. You say, well, why would we do that? Because when we defend the religious rights of others, we are defending our own. I want you to notice what uh, Thomas Jefferson had to say about this. It behooves every man who values liberty of conscience for himself to resist invasions of it in the case of others. Or their case may, by change of circumstances, become his own. <laughs> Pretty wise words, right? Do you know Jefferson understood the dangers of the clergy influencing the state? How would he know that? Lucky guess. No, he knew the 1260 years. He knew the colonial period. Notice what he had to say. The clergy by getting themselves established by law and engrafted into the machine of government have been a formidable engine against the civil and religious rights of man. <laughs> he also said in 1813, history I believe furnishes no example of a priest ridden people maintaining a free civil government. This marks the lowest grade of ignorance of which their civil as well as religious leaders will always avail themselves for their own purposes. In another statement he said, In every country and in every age the priest has been hostile to liberty. He is always in, in, in alliance with the despot abetting his abuses in, turn for, in return for protection to his own. Here's another one. 
to suffer the civil magistrate to intrude his powers into the field of opinion and to restrain the profession or propagation of principles on supposition of their ill tendency is a dangerous fallacy which at once destroys all religious liberty because he being of course judge of that tendency will make his opinions the rule of judgment and approve or condemn the sentiments of others only as they shall square with or differ from his own. Are you understanding that statement? Here's another one. Reason and free inquiry are the only effectual agents against error. Give a loose to them, they will support the true religion by bringing every false one to their tribunal to the test of their investigation. They are the natural enemies of error and of error only. So you need to have freedom of reason and inquiry in order to discover the truth and in order to defeat error. Now several years, this is very important, several years after the drawing up and the ratification of the founding documents of the nation, Jefferson looked back on the history of the United States up to that point. This is in the year 1808, and notice what Jefferson had to say. We have solved by fair experiment the great and interesting question whether freedom of religion is compatible with order in government and obedience to the laws. And we have experienced the quiet as well as the comfort which results from leaving everyone to profess freely and openly those principles of religion which are the indications of his own reason and the serious convictions of his own inquiries. So he says, experience has shown that this is a good system. We find also this statement, our fellow citizens, and this is, uh, uh, you know, this is something that is being written in 1826, our fellow citizens, after half a century of experience and prosperity, continue to approve the choice we made. May it be to the world what I believe it will be, to some parts sooner, to other parts later, but finally to all, the signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to bind themselves and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. That form which we have substituted, substituted for that old form, by the way, restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion. All eyes are open or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palatable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few, favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God. These are grounds of hope for others, for ourselves. Let the annual return of this day, that is the 4th of July, forever refresh our recollections of these rites and an undiminished devotion to them. So he's telling us, live up to the foundations that were laid by uh, the founders of the nation. Now some people have argued that Jefferson believed that only the federal government was bound by the First Amendment and not the individual states, that states could uh, kind of uh, you know, do their own thing when it came to separation of church and state and religious liberty. But the fact is that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution says that, what, that this applies to the states as well. Uh, I want you to notice what Jefferson had to say uh, to Samuel Miller on January 23, the year 1808. I consider the government of the United States as interdicted by the Constitution from intermeddling in religious institutions, their doctrines, discipline, or exercises. Are you understanding what he's saying? Uh, this results not only from the provision, now not only results from the First Amendment according to him, this results not only from the provision that no law shall be made respecting the establishment or free exercise of religion, but from that also which reserves to the states the powers not delegated to the United States. So is he saying that the 14th Amendment also applies to 
to this issue of separation of church and state to the states? Absolutely. He continues to say, certainly no power to prescribe any religious exercise or to assume authority in religious discipline has been delegated to the general government. It must rest with the states as far as it can be in any human authority. The 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution to say that what applied federally in the First Amendment applies as well to the states. Now, in the year 1802, the Danbury Baptist Association wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson asking what guarantee they would have of civil and religious liberty. And uh, Jefferson wrote a letter back to them, and this is where we get the metaphor of the wall of separation between church and state. I want to read a portion of what Jefferson wrote back to them. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I, ought, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature, that is the Congress, should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Did uh, Thomas Jefferson believe in the separation of church and state? Did he believe that religion had a place? Did he believe that the state had a place? Did he believe that they should be mingled? No, this was radically different than anything that had been experimented with before. It will be noticed that the first two clauses of the First Amendment guarantee religious rights. Congress can't make a law that establishes a religious observance, and it cannot make a law that forbids people from practicing their religion. But the third uh, clause of the First Amendment guarantees civil rights. So in the First Amendment to the Constitution, we have the two horns like a lamb. The first two clauses guarantee religious liberty. The last clause guarantees civil liberty. So in the First Amendment, we have the content of the two horns like a lamb. Now, what would James Madison say about this? You know, James Madison uh, was, uh, was one of the great founding fathers. He's actually known as the father of the Constitution. Um, I'm going to skip um, what we find under James Madison in Memorial and Remonstrance. You can read that, and uh, also Religious Freedom in Virginia and America. And we're going to go to the subtitle that says James Madison Statements. James Madison Statements. You can read uh, here about uh, Memorial and Remonstrance. It's an interesting history. Uh, in the, uh, it's a chapter in the history of uh, civil and religious liberty, but we don't have the time to read that. You can read it at your leisure. Now, in a letter to Edward Livingston, James Madison once stated, I observe with particular pleasure the view you have taken of the immunity of religion from civil jurisdiction in every case where it does not trespass on private rights or the public peace. Are you understanding what he's saying? Is the church immune from the influence of the state? Yes. It says, I observe with particular pleasure the view you have taken of the immunity of religion from civil jurisdiction and in every case where it does not trespass on private rights, in other words, on the rights of other people, or the public peace. He also stated, there is not a shadow of right in the general government to inter intermeddle with religion. Its least interference with it, that is with religion, would be a most flagrant usurpation. I can appeal to my uniform conduct on this subject that I have warmly supported religious freedom. So is there any shadow of right that the government should intermeddle in religion? No. Even the least interference? Not even the least interference. He also stated in 1822, an alliance or coalition between government and religion cannot be too carefully guarded against. Every new and successful example therefore of a perfect separation between ecclesiastical and civil matters is of importance. 
religion and government will exist in greater purity without rather than with the aid of government. Is that clear? I mean it's so absolutely clear. Uh, and then James Madison says the United States is teaching a great lesson to the world. See the US became an example for other nations in Europe, in Latin America, all over the world to establish this style of government. This is what he stated. We are teaching the world the great truth that governments do better without kings and nobles. In other words, that's a Republican style of government. Rather than with them, the merit will be doubled by the other lesson that, the, that we're teaching the world. And that is that religion flourishes in greater, greater purity without than with the aid of government. Once again, separation of what? Of church and state. Here's another statement. It may not be easy in every possible case to trace the line of separation between the rights of religion and the civil authority with such distinctness as to avoid collisions and doubts on unessential points. The tendency to usurpation on one side or the other or to a corrupting coalition or alliance between them will best be guarded against by an entire abstinence of the government from interference in any way whatsoever beyond the necessity of preserving public order and protecting each sect against trespasses on its legal rights by others. I mean how could the founding fathers be clearer? Here's another one. It was the universal opinion of the century preceding the last and this is during the 1260 years by the way, that civil government could not stand without the prop of a religious establishment, and that the Christian religion itself would perish if not supported by the legal provision for its clergy. The experience of Virginia conspicuously, conspicuously corroborates the disproof of both opinions. The civil government though bereft of everything like an associated hierarchy, possesses the requisite stability and performs its functions with complete success. Whilst the number, the industry, and the morality of the priesthood and the devotion of the people have been manifestly increased by the total separation of the church from the state. So does the church function better without the state? Does the state function better without the church? Absolutely. Here's another one. I'm reading several of these. You say, why do you read all of these? We have them in the syllabus. Well, because they're going to be people that are going to be watching this. And because I want you to see that the testimony is overwhelming. And I'm only giving you a, giving you a sampling. There's more. Notice uh, uh, what James Madison said in Memorial and Remonstrance. We hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion, or the duty which we owe our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. The religion, then, of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man, and that it is his, and that it is his right, that it is the right of every man, rather, to exercise it as these may dictate. And then on another letter, 1787, no distinction seems to be more obvious than that between spiritual and temporal matters. Yet whenever they have been made objects of legislation, they have clashed and contended with each other till one or the other has gained the supremacy. So he says neither the state nor the church should have the dominant. They should function separately. And here's another one. The experience of the United States is a happy disproof of the error so long rooted in the unenlightened minds of well-meaning Christians, that's by the way the 1260 years, as well as in the corrupt hearts of persecuting usurpers, that without a legal incorporation of religious and civil polity, neither could be supported. A mutual independence is found most friendly to practical religion, to social harmony, and to political prosperity. Now, I must say that sometimes the Founding Fathers themselves were inconsistent. <laughs> you see, this shows that it's possible to believe in the two horns like a lamb and speak like a dragon. 
Let's notice, let's introduce this, and then we'll come back to it in our next session. Uh, some revision, revisionist historians, such as David Barton, have shown that the founders of the United States were always not consistent with the principles of separation of church and state. This is true, but the conclusion that Barton draws from this fact is false. Timothy Hall explains one example of a, a bold-faced contradiction between Madison's opinions and his actions. And I read now from Timothy Hall. Madison's actions did not always coincide with his professed opinions. <laughs> Does that sound like the beast that has two horns like a lamb but speaks like a dragon? Yes. Particularly with those he professed late in his life. So he grew in his understanding, didn't he? Late in his life he had clear the idea of separation. But uh, early, earlier in his life, you know, his actions kind of contradicted, some, contradicted sometimes his professed opinions. He continues writing, for example, it has been noted that on the same day Madison introduced Jefferson's bill for establishing religious freedom in the Virginia legislature, which is bill number 84, he also introduced a bill for the punishment of Sabbath breakers. <laughs> I say, well, what are you talking about? The same day? You, are you saying that the same day that he said that they're supposed to be two horns like a lamb, he's saying that there needs to be religious legislation? Does that show that it is possible for a nation to have these two principles in theory but to deny them in practice? Absolutely. Uh, Madison pushed through the Virginia legislature a bill, legislature, a bill that was called a bill for punishing disturbers of religious worship and Sabbath breakers. <laughs> this was clearly a religious law established by the Virginia legislature and thus a violation of Madison's and Jefferson's principles. Thus early in the history of the United States, even the founding fathers we're doing exactly what the land beast of Revelation would eventually do, claiming to uphold two principles while at the same time undermining them. And this was the law that Madison proposed. If any person on Sunday shall himself be found laboring at his own or any other trade or calling, or shall employ his apprentices, servants, or slaves in labor, or other business, except it be in the ordinary household, he shall forfeit the sum of ten shillings for every such offense. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.